All right, y'all come on around because we got about a minute and we're going to get this thing started. Hey, man. Hey, Pastor. Doing all right? All right. You know where your wife is? Tommy? Hosier. Yes, sir. You know where your wife is? I do. Good. I put my foot down and she went to the lineman there. Okay. <laughs> so she's not in the building? No, sir. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And went the, went the other way. All right. Well, good evening, True Light. How's everybody? Wonderful. All right then. All right then. Let me. Uh, let's pray because I'm gonna need your heart right. I when I when I approach you in the next few minutes, I, your heart gonna need to be right to hear what I have to say. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you and we give you glory. Sometimes it. Life appears that it's just day after day after day, but what it's actually coming to is a conclusion. It's coming to an end. But while we yet have breath, help us to see you, see you, to know you in a way that we never have before. Amen. And Lord, that takes hard intentional pursuit. Make us that way. Give us a heart that will run after you. We love you now. We're going to try to better that tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. It is um, good to be here. I want to cover something for y'all. And then after I say it to you, I want you to help me to apply it. Help me to make everyone else apply it. OK. Um, on Wednesdays and Sundays for a long time now, we have we have visitors. OK, we have people that visit with us that come and check the church out or they're looking for a church. Or often people come and they're hurting. They're hurting. They're new to us and things like that. When people come to the church that are new and they are not appropriate whether they are male or female, uh, we ran into the last three or four weeks where there's been a correction of, of these people. Please don't do that. Okay, it's just like a person that would come that would be um, a lesbian or a sodomite or whoever they may be, as long as they are not acting out, the first criteria to speak into a person's life is to befriend them. To show them the love of Christ, we'll have that conversation in time. We'll have, unless there's something that arises that you have to address. Most women, a lot of women come into the church that are worldly. They don't know how to dress. Their shirts are, sh or their skirts are short. They look like shirts <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> they look inappropriately dressed. Let them, let them have it. Let them have it. If they come down and pray, get the, you know, the things that we cover them with, stuff like that, or they sit on the front, please continue to do that. But be nice first, okay? Win people over first. Welcome, be welcoming, and then there will come a day when you can speak to their life and speak into their life. But it's, uh, it's not your first duty to correct because, see, remember you. Remember when you came to the Lord, okay? And there's not, there's not, sometimes people are hurting. And sometimes people are doing the best that they can do. You have to be sensitive to that, to a newcomer in the house of, in the, house of the Lord. Churches get a bad name for things like that, okay? On the other hand, um, our ushers, those of you that are ushers that are here, you carry this word back to other people. Um, Y'all need to pay attention and, and give people Kleenex that need them and do your duty. That's not happening to a great degree, okay? If you know what, if, I won't bash on you too bad, but I'll come to y'all's auxiliary meeting next time and show y'all what I'm talking about, okay? The church is about serving. It's about serving people. 
And you cannot tell people about Jesus when you're not acting like him. Okay? So act like him. Love first, correct second. Okay? Love first, correct maybe third or fourth. Okay? But when Jesus would meet people, he would meet their need, and then he would speak to them about the gospel. Okay? That's the criteria. Meet the need and then speak to the problem. All righty. Okay. I want to, there was a lady around town. She lives here in Midland and she sent me a, she sent me a sermon by um, a now deceased minister who's went on. And many of y'all know and have heard of David Wilkerson. David Wilkerson is the founder of Teen Challenge, you know, um, I met him. I've talked with him. I have uh, years and years ago uh, when he was a much younger man, but he died in a car wreck down in East Texas, Central Texas, some years, a few years back. But he preached a he preached a sermon, Times Square Church, um, on the topic or the subject of anguish. Where's the anguish? And uh, I sent it out. Well, I guess right what during the right before we had the marriage seminar, I sent it to the ministers, and I wanted them to listen to this sermon along with their wives. If they couldn't, I wanted them to listen to it themselves. Let me tell you something about the heart of the preacher. That eventually ought to be the heart of the listener. Because a student ought to be becoming like their teachers. Okay? If that's not happening, something is wrong. In this message, he talked about anguish. He talked about the fact that why does revival not last anymore? Why, does, why is it that the very thing sometimes that Christ died for, we indoctrinate ourselves with. Foul language, pornography, television shows that's, that's inappropriate, that we would not sit with Jesus and watch. Okay? Um, murder and mayhem and all of these kinds of things that go on Gavin Newsom, the governor of California, Friday, last Friday, signed into law that California would be the first transgender free state. That you can come and have our surgeons to do whatever they you want them to do to you, child or adult, you do not need parental permission. He signed it in the law. He said, we want to be that kind. We want to initiate the beginning of receiving people who want to do with their body what they want to do with their body. Let me tell you something, True Light, and those of you that are listening on Facebook and YouTube, it is the mutilation of a child. If you take us eight or nine or 10 or 11 or 12 or 13 year old child and you slaughter their body in surgery and call it sexual reassignment. If you do that to a child, you mutilated that child for life. And that ain't pretty. And that ain't cool with God. Children are a reward. They are a blessing. And I remember when I was a boy. It's been a long time ago. But I used to play dolls with my sister. She had Barbie dolls and other dolls. I played dolls with her. I, she had a 
you must, some of y'all won't know nothing about this, but she had an easy bake oven. I bake little cakes with her because I get to eat them. I, I just play with her, you know. I just play with her. And, and we did all kinds of stuff. Then we would go outside and climb trees. Play marbles together. Do all kinds of, of things. I am fully man. But as a kid, you don't know, you don't even, kids shouldn't even be thinking about that kind of stuff. And we're creating a culture of adults that are maiming children for life. Where is the church for the most part? Silence. Yesterday we met with uh, Congressman August Pfluger. He, he came down and wanted to meet with some of the pastors of the city to talk about the church and what he could do to help the church stay free and to preach the gospel, to be free to preach the gospel to people. And I mentioned a program. I said, everybody comes to Austin and do their forums and stuff. Every year, all across, they come from all over the state to do their forums. I said, why don't you allow us and you sponsor it and put on a restoration and recovery of the family forum. They fell in love with the idea. And so we're looking into how to bring that about perhaps um, next year. Because the thing that's under attack is family, the traditional family. It is attempting to be redefined by the culture of insanity. You hear me? People are crazy, man, and they're leading us. They're leading us. We are, President Biden has taken the strategic oil reserve and taken oil from it and putting it on the market to bring down the price of gasoline. What does that do to our backup system? If mayhem happened. What does that do to the country? It takes away and cripples our national defense. He said today and last week that he's going to put 10 million more gallons of oil into the system to try to keep the gas prices down before November. That's what he's doing. But it's not, it's not going to work. OPEC, yeah, they got it. OPEC has turned against him. We are on the brink of a war if this man don't shut up and start doing some things right. He's going to take us into a war. I'll end that for now to get back to what I was talking about. All of this mayhem that's going on, not only in our country, but around the world, brings me to Nehemiah. And this part of this message that David Wilkerson talked about in the sense of anguish and agony. If you are a Christian man and a woman, and I'm assuming that everybody under the sound of my voice is, or else you wouldn't be here, or you would not be listening. Where is your anguish? If you are a Christian and you have no anguish or agony over what you see, you in trouble. Not what you see. You go back in the scripture and every time God was going to do something with the culture that he was speaking to. He always brought about a man, but he had to take that man and put him in the belly of a whale or on the backside of a desert somewhere. To break that man to see what he saw. And when the man was fine tuned enough. 
he would send him to declare the message to the people. Ezekiel lost a wife and the Lord told him, don't weep. Get up and go do what I told you to do and tell the people what I said. He could only do that because he felt the grief and it would be released in the message. A minister cannot preach a God. We are in an age where ministers are, are, are seeking to be class presidents of the pulpit. They're seeking to be uh, valedictorians of the pulpit. And they have no agony over what they see. Let me show you. Go to the book of Nehemiah, chapter 1. There were three phases in where we, we read about Nehemiah, but it, the building, rebuilding of Jerusalem, it, it, was, it had three different phases to it. And Nehemiah, where we pick up here, is being called by God to restore the walls around the city of Jerusalem. The temple had been rebuilt earlier. Ezra had come along and done some things. And now we're at that point where Nehemiah was commissioned by God to build, rebuild the wall around his city. And he would do it in 52 days. In that short a period of time, he'd rebuild the wall. It says here, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hekeliah. It came to pass in the month of Chislev, November or December, around that time of year, in the 12th year, as I was in Shushan of the citadel, that Hanani, this was his brother, one of his siblings, one of my brethren came with men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped who had served the captivity and concerning Jerusalem. This was, they were, Artaxerxes was uh, the king and they were under Persian rule. And mind you, he was telling him, you're going to reconstruct the wall of Jerusalem under the pressure of being under a Persian king, under the rule of a Persian king. God was going to give him favor of a man that would have nothing to do with his people. So, the survivors who were left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down and its gates are burned with fire. Now, this next part that we're going to read, we're going to read his prayer. But I want you to see something before, before we read his prayer. I need you to understand something about the man, Nehemiah. If he were in this age of the church, he would not be a prophet or a priest as he was not here. He would be a member of the church that sat out in the congregation and listened to the preacher every Sunday. He was nothing of a prophet, and he was nothing of a priest. He was just a member of the church. Watch his heart. So it was that I heard these words. He had asked about his people, and he heard the the condition of those that he loved and that he, some of them he didn't even know. And the scripture says that they, it was reported to him that they were in distress. And when he heard these words, it did something to him, Tommy. 
He said, the scripture said that I sat down and wept. And I and mourned for how long? This wasn't something that he heard that bothered him for a moment. How fast does the condition of the world hit you and off, run through your head with no real concern by you? You're watching the destruction of a nation right in your own eyesight and in your own hearing. How is it resonating with you? How is it resonating with you? that the people of God seem to not care. That the divorce rate among Christians is just as high as it is among anybody else. Why is that not bothering the church? Why do we have such a casual approach to the things of God? Why are we so relaxed and at ease in Zion? Why aren't we in anguish over what we see? Why aren't we crying? Your heart may not be where you think it is. When you can look up on, look here. There was a man yesterday, day before yesterday, that got arrested in Odessa? In the hospital? You, 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 you heard about that? Yeah, he went in, knocked the nurse down, went to some child, somebody's child, and just started choking the baby and shaking it. And then... They got him off of that one, and he grabbed another one. Something is wrong, y'all. And if that does not bother your soul, then something is wrong with you. If it can hit you in your hearing and leave you just this quick, something is wrong with you. You have no anguish and agony. Let me read you the definition of these words. Anguish is defined as this. To distress with extreme pain and grief. This pain can either be in body or mind or both. Anguish signifies any keen distress in you. And it causes sorrow, remorsefulness, despair, and other kindred passions. This is what you ought to be feeling when you look at things in our world that are being normalized that should never be even considered to be normal. When a medical doctor from East Texas can say to Congress that yes, a man can have a baby, that ought to distress you. Because what he feels, he feels is true. But in his mind, he's got to know that that's not a possibility. So what's feeding him to say such a thing? What, what feeds a man? Like, what's the man that won all the bike contests that's yeah. What feeds a man to change his nature 
in His name. What feeds a man that now calls himself RuPaul? Who finances a television show of drag queens? and force feeds the culture that is right. And I'm gonna tell you like this, RuPaul, Rudan, they're all Ru ugly. <laughs> and I will take the most common of women and classify them as more brutal than any man that wants to be her. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because it cannot be true that a man can be a woman. It's never going to happen. You can cut them up, drug them up, shoot them up, like the man in North Carolina, you can do it all, but you cannot change the DNA of what God made you. And if you believe that, then you believe a lie and you perpetrate a lie. And what's wrong with the church that won't call it what it is? And there are people in Midland and there are churches in Midland that won't approach the subject because it will cause a split in the church. Honey, let, the, let it split. Let it split. Preacher, if you won't call sin what it is, you're going to give an account for it. Amen. You better call it what it is. It's easy to tell the drug addict what he is. It's easy to tell the whoremonger what they are. Why can't we tell the rest of the story? That the Bible said it is wrong for a man to lie with another man. Why won't we say that from the pulpit? Because we have some in the audience that have family members that are. Or perhaps they are. All right, we, yes. Or we give money, they give bunches of money, but they got these maladies that they struggle with, but to keep their money, keep quiet. The only way, let me tell you something. The rich are going to be saved the same way the poor are. Oh, but you got to hear me. And chills run down my back when I say this because all ground is level at the cross. Every man, every woman, every boy, every girl, every color, every nation is equal at the foot of the cross. Rich, black, white, poor, Asian, Grace and mercy better find you or hell will. That, uh, that's just the truth. God ain't going to get me. Hey, I'm not going to stand before God and God say to me, did you preach the cross? And did you tell me about their sins? I'm going to say, Lord, and I told them about mine too. You better hear what I'm saying. Let's finish what this man said. Agony. Let me give you the other definition. That was for anguish. And anguish comes from a, a, the, a root word that denotes narrow. Anguish has a narrow scope. And in so, it's like trying to... How many of you have ever had sinus problems? It's trying to breathe through nostrils and, a, and your air passages are stopped up. 
Do you know how that makes you feel? You know then. If you suffer with sinuses, you know how that feels. Your head is pounding, man. And you can't get in a relief. That's the kind of spiritual anguish you ought to feel over what you see in the world that does not please God. And it doesn't matter who it's in. And the first person you ought to see it in is you. Agony means anguish. It Agony means the violent struggle or contest that are present in battle. Let me, I want you to understand that it's not the battle. It's the pressure you're feeling in the battle. You, you ever, y'all ever compete in basketball or football, volleyball, any of those things? It's that feeling you get when you line up around the circle or the kickoff and everybody's anticipating the game. I'm not talking about those in the stands. I'm talking about those on the field. You read the scattering reports. You know all the strengths and weaknesses of the other team, but they know yours too. And there's about to be a collision in the Coliseum. A contest of will. A contest of strength. An unseen battle that's going to play out, but you can't see the end. That's what agony is. You feel it's not the battle itself. It's what you're feeling in the battle. What are you feeling about what you see in the world? Does it bother you? Then churches... There are some churches that you can go to that sound like a rock concert. It sounds like a concert is going on. It's not worship. It's just noise and clanging. But there is no worship because where there is worship, there's an altar filled with people. There's brokenness. There are hands in the air crying out, Lord, it is me. Standing in the need of prayer, it's me, O oh Lord. They're not in worship with coffee. They're not in worship on their cell phone, seeing what the stock market is doing. They are broken men and women over their sins and their trespasses against the Holy God. They're broken. And if the preacher is not himself broken, the people will never be. They will never be. Agony. Anguish. Over what we see. Because a lot of what we see, we are the cause. Do you hear me? Anguish, agony. It's, it's not just the pain in battle, but it's prolonged pain and suffering. As Nehemiah said, as we read it in the scripture, that he mourned for days. He didn't hear what was wrong with his people, James and just run off to a corner for a few minutes and say, just let me have my space for a second. This man was in agony for days. Sometimes, man, listen, when you turn the mirror on you, it ought to send you into distress. Not over what you see, but what you don't care about Amen. that offends God in you. Wow, what a statement. 
There are things you wrestle with that you're trying your best to overcome. Good. But they shouldn't bother you because they bother God. But if they're only bothering God and not you, there is no agony. There's no agony. You can't just say I talk crazy to people and treat people bad and repent for it in church. Get up and go do the same thing again with no remorsefulness. It's just hard for you to apologize to people that you wrong. But it's easy for you to ask God to forgive you. Did you get what I said? It's easy in your eyes for God to forgive you. But it is a it is a monumental task for you to forgive somebody that even look at you crazy. He ain't said nothing to you. You just don't like the way they looked at you. And they all kind of names and everything else. And they simply had a headache and couldn't see you. And in your mind, you've built up a lie that don't even exist. Wow. In the book of Nehemiah, I'm going to read the rest of this, this prayer to you. But I want you to understand something about the story itself. The first chapter, first chapter one, one through 12 of Nehemiah happened over about the period of a year. And between 12, chapter 12 and 13, there's about a 20 year gap. Nehemiah wrestled with these people for a long time. Let's read the rest of his prayer. He mourned for many days, the scripture says. He said, and I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. So his mourning and his grief engaged him in an activity. His distress, his agony, his brokenness drove him to fasting and praying. He wasn't just moaning and crying and oh me. He turned his grief to fasting and praying. And he said, I pray, Lord, of, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with these who love you and observe your commandments. As a plea to God, please hear. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night. This is not necessarily one continual prayer that he was doing, but in these days of mourning, he kept going back to God with his grief. He kept going back to God with what he was seeing. He kept going back to God with what his heart was feeling. You follow what I'm saying? He was doing something to bring heaven to earth. He was just not trying to reach God. He needed God to reach him. I hope you get what I'm saying. A lot of times we have a lot of this noise out of our mouth going up. But we bet we have very little request of him to come down. And it is not, nothing really happens when earth meets heaven. But when heaven, when heaven meets earth, there's quakes that go on. Right. The quakes do not happen in heaven. The quakes happen in us on earth. Boy, that's heavy right there. That's deep. The quakes shake us up. 
God shakes up the, we don't shake up heaven. But when heaven comes to us, it moves us. It shakes us. And that's where change takes place, man. God's not changing, but he brought heaven to us to change us. God takes a crooked walk and he makes it straight. God takes an alcoholic and he makes him free. God takes a drug addict and he is no more. I'm telling you what God can do. But you got to cry out. Nehemiah cried out. He didn't cry out from somebody else's pain. Nehemiah cried out from his own aching heart. And I'll show you. Please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now day and night for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you. He didn't separate himself away from the people. His prayer said, Lord, I am one of them. I am one of them. You wonder why Pastor Roy cries so much? Because I'm one of them. It means nothing that I preach the gospel. It means nothing. The same grace that needs to find you needs to find me. And if it does not, I can preach an eternity almost on earth, die and go to hell. How heavy is that? Think about what I'm telling you. You can have an assent to God in your mind and not own him in your heart. And you've heard me say this, and I'm going to say it again tonight. If you are not changing, you are not growing. If you aren't changing, if the word of God is not changing you, you're not growing. You better wake up. You are stagnant. Something has blocked your view of God. And something has hindered your mind to make you believe you're somewhere that you aren't. If you are not changing, you are not growing. You have become much like water that cannot flow off. It becomes stagnant, mildewed, and smelly because it has lost its freshness. There is no supply running through to clean it. It's just sitting. It's just sitting. And it's getting infected by the day. Is that your life? The word of God is not washing you. It's not changing you because you're not in it. The word of God is not washing you. It's not changing you because you don't pray. It's not washing you and changing you because when you pray, you are informing God and not allowing the spirit to inform you. Are you changing? If you're not hurting, you're not changing. Because when the Lord get through with you, you're going to walk with a limp. You understand? When the Lord get through with you, you're going to walk with a limp. Because he got to take some things from you that's going to hurt. Mm. We have sinned against you. Both my father's, my father's house, he says, and I 
have sinned. My parents sinned against you and I'm following their footsteps. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. Remember, I pray the word that you commanded your servant Moses saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. And that's what he did when he sent the, the Assyrians and the Babylonians. In Daniel's day, he destroyed the land. He put them out of it. What I'm talking about is not sin here and there. I'm talking about an utter rebellion and a turning away from God. The Lord watched his people do that. And whatever it is that tears at you and eats it, you got to fight. You just can't concede it. You got to admit it. I don't care if you do it again. You got to admit it that God is displeased with me. You hear me? Your heart has to be broken over you and what you see, not just what you see in the people, but you got to pray to God, I'm one of them, Lord. Ah, oh, easy it is to point out other people's problems. It's easy. It's easy. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them. Though some of you were cast out of the out to the forest part of the heavens, yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Now, these are those. Now, these are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. Oh, Lord, I pray. Please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant. This is the second time he said that. And to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name. And let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. For I, for the king's cupbearer. In all that Nehemiah and his people had done, God still showed him favor. Why did he show him favor? Simply because his heart was toward him. His heart was toward him. And when you continue to read the story, you would see these men and women rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem. The scripture said like this. With a sword in one hand and a brick in the other. And they did it on the watches. Family by family. He caused each family to work at a certain time of day. Until the job was done. Are you and your family building the walls here? Do you have the sword in one hand while your work is the brick in the other? If you are not, God is not pleased with you. Because you are seeking him and every part of your seeking is for selfish reasons. You want nothing to do with the betterment of the walls of the city of God. It's all about you. It's all about you. Nehemiah rebuilt the walls in the midst of a nation that despised the people. They sent people to criticize his work, to talk about him, to discourage him, to make him quit. Have people made you quit? Have what people said about you caused you to shut down and go back? Or are you still fighting? Are you still fighting? 
This is not about the kingdom of Democrats or Republicans. It's about the kingdom of God, man. You better get this right. I don't care who in office. This really don't have nothing to do with them. You can't get to heaven by being a good politician. You can't get to heaven by being a Republican. Democrat. Independent. Don't vote. You can't get to heaven that way. Everything that you see is passing away. And I'm closing with this. Because this is what the Bible says. Only what you do for Christ will last. Only, James, what you do for Christ will be written down in the book of life. Not how you voted, man. Not who you voted for. Do all that stuff. But understand, no man is king of kings. There's only one of those. No man is Lord of lords. There's only one of those. His name is not Biden. His name is not Trump. His name is Jesus. That's his name. That's him. That's him. Jesus, he's my king. I'm trying to get out of here. But I don't have but one Lord. And Jesus, is it don't be, don't get it twisted. I'm going to vote. And I'm going to vote the best I can. But my trust is not in man. My trust ain't even in Roy. My trust. You know him. You know him. Let's go. Stand up, y'all. Let's get out of here. Lord, thank you tonight. That heaven and earth will pass away. But your kingdom is eternal. Amen. I don't know where I'll be when you'll come. Whether my head will be lying asleep in the grave or whether I will be alive on the earth. But I do know this. I will be caught up with you in the air. And I meditate and I think about what it will be like to look into your eyes of fire. To behold you. To look at your hands and your feet. To hear you say, well done. Well done, thy good. Faithful servant. You were not faithful over a lot. But you were faithful over a little. Come on up. I want to make you rule over much. I don't know where I'll be. But I do know that in eternity. I will be with you. Thank you Lord. For saving a wretch like me. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you tonight.